All right, well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. I am really excited to have our pesticide dream team with us today. We have a May Code, who is the pesticide program director. Emily May, who is the pollinator conservation specialist. These two will be presenting today. And we have Sharon Salvaggio, our pesticide program specialist with Xerces to support us in answering all of your questions. So thank you all for being here today and I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to Amay. Hey, thank you all. Thank you so much for coming. Um, usually I do these sort of presentations in this small intimate setting and now I'm in a small intimate setting but I'm all alone. So I was hoping to kind of bring you into to my little world as we start this talk about our gardens. Uh, and I live in the Southern Willamette Valley in Eugene, Oregon. And if you're familiar with our weather, you know that our summers are extremely dry. So my pollinator garden is very drought tolerant. I only water when, when um, I'm, I'm getting something established. So today my garden is so happy because we have a very rare event, it's raining. And I'm looking out my window right now at my goldenrod and my asters. And those are my, and you can see the asters right here in front of you. Those are my late season floral resources. So I'm really excited to, to have this rain today. Uh, if you could see me, my hair is still wet because I thought if I'm gonna talk about my garden, I'm gonna futz around in my garden this morning. Um, still drinking my coffee after playing in the garden all day. So a lot of you are probably Xerces members. You know a lot about us, but for those of you who, who don't know Xerces, we've been around for almost 50 years. We're a conservation organization that focus, focuses on the foundation of life, really the life that sustains us, our invertebrate populations. And I often read a quote from E.O. Wilson, so I'm going to flip to that right now because I think it really describes why it is that we need to be focusing on our invertebrates. The truth is, is that we need invertebrates, but they don't need us. If human beings were to disappear tomorrow, the world would go on with little change. But if invertebrates were to disappear, I doubt that the human species could last more than a few months. I think that's a good perspective for us to understand. These invisible creatures often that we don't even notice are really maintaining so much life. So to protect them, we use all the tools that we feel that we can to, to do what we can to protect these species. That means we're advocating for policy change. We are out there doing scientific research to understand these species, understand the risk they face and how best to protect them. We're doing outreach events like this one today. Um, so thank you so much for being a part of that. And I think we're probably best known for all of the habitat creation. It amazes me to think that already we have supported the creation of over a million acres of pollinator habitat and counting. Right now, I'm guessing that there are Xerces staff out right now making sure we have more habitat getting into the ground. Obviously, we don't do it alone. We have so many partners, farmers, researchers, all the foundations that help us. In fact, I really want to thank the um, Anthropocene Institute, because they actually funded this particular training for happening. So thank you very much. Um, we also have a number of other grants, government and uh, foundations that come in, a number of, of different companies that help us. Obviously, a lot of you are our member and couldn't do it without you. You know, I've been at Xerces now for a little over six years, and I have been so impressed by how curious our members are to understand species and how motivated they are to be a part of change. So thank you, Xerces members, for all that, all that you do. Um, and if any of you who aren't members and you want to join us, please do join us. So today you're joining us here to talk about home gardening and to get some tips how to manage the pests in your garden in a way that's going to be pollinator friendly and really create sanctuaries for the insects around us. To do that, we've got, we've got a lot for the next to do in, in an hour. I'm going to start with a very brief introduction to our native bees. The, if we're going to protect species, uh, we can do so more effectively the more we understand that species. What are their needs? What is their lifestyle like? They're, then we know how to best provide those resources to them. So we'll start there. Then we're going to hone in on pesticide threats because 
while there are a number of drivers that are impacting our pollinators and other invertebrate decline, pesticide use is something that in your own garden you can make choices to avoid and to better protect. Then we're going to kind of dive into the solutions. How do we build a healthy, resilient yard? A lot of that's going to be background. Maybe it's going to be reminders, but it kind of sets the stage to understand a healthy system in our gardens. And then Emily May is going to wrap us up today with doing some sleuthing, identifying and responding to pests in your yard, taking a step back to how do we, how do we really resolve these pest problems? So let's dive in. Uh, for a lot of you who are members, this is going to be a bit of a review, but for hopefully a few of you, this will be something new to think about. There are so many pollinators out there. We've got hummingbirds and, you know, bats, but we also have, you know, butterflies, moths, beetles, wasps, flies, and of course, our, our bees. And today we're honing these mostly because otherwise it would be such a huge topic. Um, you know, we've got 3,600 species of bees in the U.S. And as you can see, they range in size, in color, and also in their behaviors. And they're all very different than the European honeybee. Obviously, there are some similarities, but, you know, honeybees are in really large overwintering colonies with thousands of bees in there together. Almost all of our native bees are solitary other than the bumblebees. So if we were to quickly break them out, we've got cavity nesting bees, which are our bumblebees, and they're in small colonies. And there's about 48 species of, of bumblebees in, in North America. We've got our ground nesting bees, and then we've got our stem and wood nesting bees, so bees that nest in pithy plants. Go a little more detail here. So ground nesting bees, like I said, about 70% of our native bees are ground nesting. And they can be found in turf, so you might find them in the turf in your yard, but you're more likely to find them on bare or exposed ground. And you might just assume that it's an ant nest when it's actually going to be native bees. You might, you're probably more likely to see them in a, in a sunny, dry place. So our tunnel nesting bees, you know, you, you can, might find them in your garden in a rose bush or a raspberries or somewhere else where you've got a pithy plant where they would survive. About 30% of our native bees are our um, tunnel nesting. And then we've got our bumblebees. A lot, a lot of times we refer to our bumblebees as, you know, the panda bear of invertebrates. You know, they're approachable and cute and almost cuddly, although they're not. Uh, it's easier to draw people in with a bumblebee than it is to draw them in with, you know, a dung beetle or a crawdad. So there's our, and our bumblebees. I'm gonna take us through just a few pictures really quickly because our bees are so amazing. There's a number of different sweat bees and when they're buzzing around you, they might be a bit of a nuisance, but they're just gorgeous. And then we've got carpenter, small carpenter bees as well as large carpenter bees. Now look at this carpenter bee and notice how shiny it is where it isn't, doesn't have that much, um, much hair, many hairs on it. Compare that to a bumblebee. A lot of people confuse the large carpenter bees with bumblebees, but the difference really is you can tell by, by the number of the hairs on the, on the bees. This is one of my favorite bees, and now is the time of year when they're most likely to be out, longhorn bees. I wander around my neighborhood seeking out blanket flowers and sunflowers where they often like to, um, to visit. Get sunflower bees. A number of bees have evolved with particular plants. Sunflower bees, squash bees are another example of this. And then we have leafcutter bees. Leafcutter bees tell a great story because um, that's exactly what they do. They carry those little leaves and they line their nests. A lot of the um, tunnel nesting bees are going to line their nests with leaves. So let's dive into some of the reasons that we're seeing declines in these amazing species so that we can better understand those risks in order to respond to them. As I mentioned before, there are multiple risk factors that our pollinators and other invertebrates face. You know, we've got habitat loss and degradation. We've got disease, non-native species, climate change. And you know, today we're gonna to dive into the concern of pesticides. All of these are not siloed. They do not act in, um, individually. What we see is we're seeing these risk factors working together, and I'll give a few examples of that as we talk through the pesticide concerns. So when I use the term pesticide, I'm using it as an umbrella term. Under, the, under that umbrella, 
we have insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, rodenticides. So oftentimes people talk about pesticides and use it synonymously with insecticides, but actually it is a bigger term. And there's a number of different pesticides beyond insecticides that can be of concern for our pollinators. You know, the three big groupings that we think about that we know are, have, have found a number of different concerns for our insecticides, fungicides, and herbicides. And I'll go through those three and the concerns that they have for our pollinators. Obviously, insecticides are, have oftentimes are considered to have the greatest risks to our invertebrates. Invertebrates, you know, many of where, you know, these are designed to kill insects, bees are insects. And I think the words of Rachel Carson still ring true for the most part, that most of the chemicals now used kill all insects, our friends and our enemies alike. We today often talk about insecticides being broad spectrum. I think Rachel Carson's words describe that much more clearly, that you, when, you're, when it's a broad spectrum insecticide, it could kill any number of species um, beyond just the targeted pest. Not all insecticides are broad spectrum. There are some that are targeted as well. So obviously there are many different classes of insecticides and we're not gonna have time to get into all of them today. I should let you all know that if you want to dive deep into pesticides, their regulation, their risks and the solutions to their use and ways to move forward in pest management, Emily May, who will be talking later today and Sharon, who is on the call today as well, did a series of webinars. There's two webinars that uh, you can find on our YouTube and, um, page and they, they will steep you in the understanding of the concerns that we're facing. So I, I definitely encourage that if that's where, where you'd like to go. Um, and I think we're planning on sending all of those resources out to you after this call so you will have those resources. So when we think about insecticides, there's many different classes. The one that we probably hear the most about linked with pollinator decline are neonicotinoids. <clears throat> and while many insecticides can be of concern, neonicotinoids kind of raise to the top for a few reasons. One, their use is really widespread. In fact, that it's really skyrocketed in the last couple of decades. On top of that, they're long lived. They persist in the environment. That means that they can potentially be toxic to different species and bees, bees and other invertebrates can be exposed for a long time. That many of these are highly toxic to bees, meaning very small amounts can kill or otherwise harm our bees. And they're systemic. They move up through a plant and they can be expressed in the pollen and nectar. That gives a direct exposure potential for any foraging insect. So that's why oftentimes they get that high profile look and they are of high risk. But we would be we would be foolish to think that just getting rid of neonicotinoids was what would, would solve the problem of pesticides for our pollinators. There are a number of different pesticides of concern and we're constantly seeing replacements. If it's not neonicotinoids, there's many older chemistries that can still be harmful. And there's a number of new chemistries we don't know that much about, but they are also systemic. Some of them are toxic and long lived as well, but we don't have the same depth of research into them. So it's, it's easy to target neonicotinoids because they are concerning, but we also need to be aware that there's a lot of other concerns as well out there. I also like to dive into some of the more subtle risks that other groups of pesticides can have. I think fungicides tell a really interesting story when we're trying to understand risks to our pollinators because, you know, in a regulatory sense, almost all of our fungicides are classified as practically non-toxic. And they can be used in ways that allow for many pollinators to be exposed. They can be applied during bloom time um, and, and other times when you might have a risk for pollinators because they are considered practically non-toxic. Yet we're starting to see subtle and concerning risks that we wouldn't otherwise have known if we weren't paying attention because of the de serious declines that we have. One of the concerns that we're seeing with these fungicides is that they can synergize with some insecticides, including the neonicotinoids. Now, this isn't all fungicides. Like insecticides, there's many classes. And today I'm, I'm doing some lumping. If you want to tease it all apart, that's when you go back to those YouTube webinars from Sharon and Emily. 
So what we see when we see, when we talk about synergy with fungicides, that was me, I'm so sorry. Um, I have a small family emergency and I forgot to turn off my ringer. So when we think about synergy with insecticides, that means that when a fungicide is combined with those insecticides, the, um, it takes less of that insecticide to cause harm. And so a smaller amount could potentially kill a bee. And that's concerning. And there are products that mix these fungicides with insecticides. Another risk that we're seeing is very similar to when a bee is malnourished. Um, you see loss of queen, you see uh, inability to fight off pathogens and disease. And we're seeing that with fungicide exposure as well. So this, these fungicides are somehow working to make that be less able to fight off other concerns. That's what I'm talking about with those, those links that these different threats do not work um, in silos. When you have a fungicide exposure, all of a sudden your, your risk of disease and pathogen impacts, it can be raised. So we get a lot of questions about herbicides at the Xerces Society. Um, a lot of restoration use herbicides in, in their management and they think, what are the concerns of these uses for, for pollinators? Obviously herbicides are designed to kill plants. So one of the biggest concerns is that we're gonna be knocking down forage and resources for our bees and butterflies and other pollinators. You can see with widespread use of a lot of herbicides in, in the Midwest, now that we have herbicide resistant crops being grown in such large acreage, that those uses have knocked down key species, including milkweed, which is the host plant for monarch butterflies. A host plant means that that is the plant that the, the caterpillar needs to feed on. That is what the, what the monarch will lay eggs on in order to, to, to reproduce. Um, so what we've seen in the Midwest is the broad, large scale use of herbicides, knocking down significant plants to the point where many scientists link that loss in milkweed with the de serious declines in, in monarchs in the Midwest. That's one very obvious example. Um, a lot of people ask us, are there direct risks that herbicides pose to, uh, to pollinators? And we don't have a lot of information on that. There's not a lot of research, um, but we are seeing there are some herbicides that do have links with causing harm to directly to pollinators. And there's, a, there's some new research that maybe some of you have already heard about, um, which again shows these subtle risks that are, are not obvious, that not evaluated within a regulatory form, where the commonly used uh, herbicide glyphosate, which is in Roundup and a number of other products, it can actually uh, impact the flora and the gut of a honeybee to the point where they're, they're weakening the flora in that honeybee's gut. And then we're seeing, you know, we're actually seeing again, similar issues where they're, those honeybees are less able to fight off pathogens. So not directly killing those bees, but potentially causing harm, much like those fungicides where you could see population level effects and a decline, even if you don't see an obvious incident. And I think that's something that I really, that's kind of a subtext message that I like to carry. A lot of people think about pesticides causing harm to our pollinators in an obvious way. There was an incident where a number of bees were killed, but I, some of the risks that I'm almost more concerned about are these subtle low level effects that are degrading populations over time. And those are the effects that we really as a group can be a part of protecting against by creating spaces in our homes and gardens where, where we don't have pesticide exposures. So it's important to point out that when I'm talking about concerns of pesticides, we don't exclude those products that are, that are used for organic use as well. Uh, the Xerces Society is a huge proponent of organic, and, but it, we still need to take a step back just because a product is registered for use in an organic setting does not mean that it has no risk. Um, you know, on our, our team, we often hear people say, but I'm, I'm only using neem oil. Well, actually, you know, neem oil 
um, and its active component as a directin, are, it's, it's an insect growth regulator. That means it's gonna affect larva. It's gonna impact an, abil uh, an insect's ability to transition and to mature. So is it organic? Yes. Is it without risk? No. Um, other, there's other products that you see, pyrethrins and spinosad up on the list. Both of those are highly toxic to pollinators, but they're also very unstable. And that means unlike those neonicotinoids that are so long lived, where you can have a very long potential for exposure, these are chemicals that, um, are, the, the, that are gonna break down very quickly. So that, so that potential for exposure is much shorter. And that's actually really important to minimize concern. So again, all back to my subtext. What is the messaging that I'm sharing because of this? I think when the Xerces Society thinks about a home garden, we're hoping that you're taking steps to go pesticide free or you know, take it, really take a step back to reduce your pesticide use because a lot of times people talk about follow the label and, and that's the way to be protective. We really feel like we're still seeing concerns even with, with uses um, according to the label. We want you to take a step even further back. We're trying to create these sanctuaries for our insects. Let's be as conservation minded as we can, as we're able to. So hopefully by the end of this, especially after Emily May has gone through all of the ideas of how to identify and, and respond to pests, you'll be able in your own garden to make some changes to reduce pesticide use. So when I said that the, you know, that you go beyond the label and, and try not to use pesticides, I was not asking you to make home remedies. And uh, Emily actually found this online the other day. I've got to read it. It's a bit horrifying. I have, and the big blue mark is because we marked off where it came from. I have powdery mildew everywhere. I have tried apple cider vinegar, milk, baking soda, dish soap, washing each leaf and, ba and base, hydrogen peroxide, all various mixes thereof. I am defeated. I've heard mouthwash as well. I don't know. I also killed one of the plants trying to create my own fungicide with a $1 foot fungus cream and water. I just put my hands to my face. Every time I read that $1 foot fungus cream, I'm horrified. Don't do this. Um, you know, even something as simple as dish soap can actually, you know, it, it isn't, it, maybe you're gonna spray it on your plant to kill a soft body of insect. Recognize that it also could affect that waxy cuticle on that plant and actually weaken your plant's own defenses. So before you go and make a home remedy, step back and let's try to find some, some, some solutions. So almost done with the whole section on pesticides and then we'll start diving into that. I, will, I think it's really important as we think about pesticide exposures and pesticide risks that we understand the many ways that bees and other invertebrates can be exposed. Um, you know, a lot of people, I think we, hopefully we can all agree that if you're gonna, if you spray a bee directly, it could cause harm and we wouldn't want to. So we wanna avoid that direct contact type of exposure that you see up on the upper left-hand side of the screen. But there's so many other ways for bees to be exposed. It isn't just about avoiding sprays when bees are foraging. As we talked about that leaf cutter bee and all those tunnel nesting bees, they're gonna be gathering leaf matter to be lining their nests. What if that plant had been sprayed and then they gather that leaf and that leaf is, is, is still contaminated? What does that mean for exposure? What is the risk from that? Uh, there's also a number of pesticides when you spray them, you know, let's say, there's a lot of people that talk about, I'm gonna spray at night instead of during the day. Well, you might spray at night, but that chemical is still active the next day when that bee comes to forage. And so we're still seeing an exposure. And then we have those, you know, we have our ground nesting bees. Many pesticides are applied as a soil drench or can drip off and contaminate the soil. Again, what is the question? What is the, what is the impact to those bees? And those bees are underground throughout the year. They're not just there during bloom time. The, you know, the maturing um, larva is going to be in there throughout that year, that juvenile. So then we have systemic contacts as well. I talked a lot about this with neonicotinoids. Um, basically a plant is sprayed either to the ground where it's uptaken by the roots or even on the leaves where it can still move into the plant and it moves in expressed in pollen and nectar. 
I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that, but oftentimes that pollen and nectar can be contaminated months to years even after an application, especially in woody plants. So let's quickly go through a couple of examples of pesticides that could be in your yard that you might not expect. And there's a lot of other examples. I'm only giving two examples today. There's a lot of other examples out there. And hopefully if people are curious, we can talk about them during the Q&A or you can ask us questions later. Um, but in the home garden, one of the things that uh, I think people wouldn't necessarily think about is insecticide use on trees. So let's say you're, or even fungicide use in your trees, your tree does not look healthy. You bring in an arborist or a tree doctor, they decide to inject something into that tree to protect it from whatever they've diagnosed. Well, what that is, that could have been a fungicide or insecticide that's gonna be move up through that tree and could be expressed in the pollen and nectar. Again, neonicotinoids have been heavily studied. So that's the research that we have. But a study done by Valent, which is a pesticide registrant, uh, they found that the neonicotinoids they looked at, if they were applied in a way to be, to, to be uptaken up through that plant, the, the pollen and nectar the next year, a year after that application, were still toxic to bees. So we want to take a step back and rethink, is this something that, is this the right choice to be making? Another surprise, maybe hidden pesticide risk around your home is that some structural pesticide, pest management can actually become a concern for your pollinators. Uh, so we not too long ago undertook a research with the University of Nevada in Reno to look at milkweed in the West and to find out what kind of pesticides were contaminated. One of the places we looked was a home garden where no pesticides had been used for at least six years. And we were surprised to find a common insecticide used in structural pest management at concerning levels on the leaves of that milkweed. And again, milkweed is the obligatory host plant for monarchs. It is the only plant that um, monarch caterpillars will eat. So we went back and we talked to the homeowner. We figured out that right before they moved in, there was a structural uh, pest control treatment that was done around the house. And when they moved in, in that, in that spot probably where that structural control occurred, they planted milkweed. So we're talking years after the planting, but those plants still had concerning levels because it was a systemic insecticide. So something to think about. It was surprising to find that, and I, that's why I wanted to share it with you. I hadn't thought of that before. Let's move on to building a resilient garden. Um, there's a lot of concerns that are out there, but there's also a lot of ways that we can make our yards healthy and um, thrive. Emily likes to refer to this as passive gardening. Then she laughs and says, well, maybe it's lazy gardening. And honestly, she's right, because if you have a well-functioning system, it doesn't require a lot of time or inputs. So, and a lot of this are simple concepts that you all might already know. Um, but I myself need reminding of them because I constantly am challenging myself and not wanting to do it. So you wanna place your plant where it can thrive. Uh, I have a lot of stories where I haven't done this. I mean, yes, how much sun does it want? How much water does it need? What type of soil does it want? Well, you know, earlier this spring, I really wanted a red flowering current that I could look out at while I was at my computer, just right here to the right. I could look at where, I, where my red flowering current is. Well, I live on a south face and it's hot and it's dry and I still put that red flowering current in. And guess what? It's too hot, it's too dry, and I knew that when I put it in. So now I'm gonna have to talk, to, as my, my grandmother taught me, I have to talk to that plant, explain to it that I need to move it where it is and it's gonna be happier. And this fall, I'm gonna move that plant somewhere else. I'll, be, I'll miss looking at it, but it will be a lot happier. Um, so taking that time to make sure you think about what those plants need and you place them where they need to be, not just where you have an open space, or where you want something to be, but actually where is it gonna be able to thrive? Similar story with my old house. Before I lived in this hot, dry, sunny south face, I lived in the bottomlands in, uh, here in the Willamette Valley with a really high water table and had a really tiny shady yard. 
And I so wanted to plant my grandmother's roses there. And I tried for years, but they just struggled. They were not meant to survive in that wet um, and shady spot. So I didn't get to grow my grandma's roses. And you know, the environment was telling me that's what I needed to do. So when you think about your garden and you think about um, where to plant things, it does help to look garden wide, you know, rather than just plant by plant. When you can, if you have that luxury, you know, putting your, your water loving plants together if you're going to be watering your yard and putting, you know, your plants, so placing things so that they're more orderly. Um, I actually, my neighbor waters, I do not water my yard, but she does. So I actually have some of, some of the plants that, that wouldn't do well in a dry area along the border to, to her, to Annette's house. Um, we do a lot of communicating and sharing seeds and other things as well, though. It's pretty fun. Another thing to think about is that for a lot of reasons, our sea society supports native plants. A lot of times it's because our pollinators, our native pollinators are more attracted to those native plants, but also they're often more adapted to an area. But saying that, you still need to be cautious because we have dramatically altered our environment. So we can't just assume just because something is from a particular area that will do well in your yard. You still have to make sure, sure that you put it in, in the right niche so that it matches with the needs of that plant. So shifting over, another important part of building a resilient garden is being aware of things like soil pH. Uh, a lot of plants like neutral soil, but sometimes when you see your plant struggling and you think it might have a disease or other issue, it actually could be that the, it doesn't have the right um, soil pH. And blueberries are a great example of that, where they actually like to be in acidic soil. Rhododendrons are another example. So just things to think about when you're trying to create the healthiest space are, I kind of like to think of it as putting yourself in the perspective of the plant. And so what does that plant need? Just like, what do we need to thrive, right? So we need the right nutrition and the base, having our basic needs taken care of. Another piece of I think having a resilient garden, a garden where you use fewer pesticides, a garden that is more welcoming to insects, is really rethinking pest and damage. Um, I, of course, you know, being a Xerxes nerd, love seeing insect activity in my garden. And, uh, you know, sometimes when we, I actually, I, and I have to check myself though, sometimes I look and I think, oh gosh, is that a pest that's been on my plant? And I take a step back and I, look at the leaf and I think, was that a pest that was there or was it maybe, you know, a leaf cutter bee that was actually, or an, another tunnel nesting bee that was using my plants to line their nest? Or was it a caterpillar that was, you know, that was eating that plant, which is a, you know, it's a good thing. Even the cabbage whites have not impacted my garden to the point where I'm concerned about them nibbling away. Another thing to think about when we're rethinking pest and damage is there's really a, a growing science that is showing much like humans with our immune system where small exposures to allergens and other you know common colds kicks our immune system in and reminds it how to work the same goes for plants sometimes small exposures to disease or pests actually helps that plant become more resilient over time, builds up their own natural immunity. So a low level of pests in your yard can actually be beneficial to help the, you know, trigger the immune response of that plant. Those low level of pests in your garden also are part of the larger system. So if you wanna be bringing in all the amazing beneficial in insects and the natural enemies that are out there, you, know, you actually wanna have low levels of pests in your yard as well. And if you want to learn more about conservation biological control and all of the natural enemies that are out there, uh, Jennifer Hopwood, who is another Xerces staff member, is going to be doing a training in a couple of weeks. And so definitely plug in for that because she is a, a, a treat to listen to. So just a quick reminder as we close on rethinking pests and damage. The vast majority of insects are beneficial to humans and less than 2% of insects are pests. 
and even those insects that we think of as pests, oftentimes what is a pest is situational. So, you know, a field mouse in the field is not a pest. A field mouse in your house is. Those ants in your garden are aerating your soil and they're a benefit in your garden. In your pantry, they're a nuisance. So just taking that step back and having a more acceptance and understanding for those, all those insects that are out there. So I'm going to close with uh, one last thought that I think I heard this for the first time, maybe 20 years ago, but I always, it really stuck with me, is that a resilient garden is addressing underlying sources of pest problems, whereas a pesticide focuses on addressing the symptoms. So as someone who, when I'm thinking about health, really likes to work from a prevention standpoint to and to make myself as healthy as I can and respond to problems, not just the symptoms. I feel like this makes sense to me. When I have a headache, you know, I don't just want to take an aspirin to get rid of that headache. I want to figure out why I have a headache. Is it tension? Is it eye strain? It probably is eye strain these days because I'm always needing new glasses. But if I were to just take an aspirin, I would just be getting rid of the symptoms. If I just spray a pesticide, I'm getting rid of the symptom of the problem. So to put that to a garden uh, setting, I have a squash flower here because squash are often uh, affected by powdery mildew. And so let's say you have powdery mildew, you go to the store, you find an organic fungicide, you're gonna use sulfur to spray to knock down that powdery mildew. Maybe you've effectively knocked down that powdery mildew, but you haven't gotten rid of what's allowing that powdery mildew to thrive. And so that powdery mildew could come back. What you need to do is you need to think about the, those underlying issues. Is it, does it need more aeration? Is it not enough airflow? Is the watering incorrect? What is causing that, that problem to arise instead of just knocking down the pest that is there because of the problem? So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Emily May, who's going to talk more about how to respond to garden pests. And I just have to say, uh, she is a avid home gardener. She's an entomologist. And as a child, she was a huge fan of Harriet the Spy. And I actually think that last point about her loving Harriet the Spy is a big reason why she's so good at identifying and responding to garden pests, because it takes a lot of sleuthing to, um, to be able to figure it out. And I hope that today she's able to give you the tools. And so this is, I'm closing on my garden. This was my garden a couple of weeks ago. But with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Emily May. Perfect, great. Okay, so as the May has already said so well, building a resilient ecosystem in your yard or garden starts with a foundation of good planning and design choosing the right plant for the right place, for the local conditions, building healthy soils, increasing plant and beneficial insect diversity, and spacing plants out so that they are receiving good sunlight and good airflow. But problems can arise in even the most well-planned gardens. Um, and when you've put so much care and time and elbow grease and resources into building your productive and beautiful space, it can be frustrating. So I'm going to sort of talk through the process that I use for my yard um, and how I approach it and then try and give you the framework for doing the same in your own garden. Um, I may have mentioned that, you know, what I'm really aiming for is passive gardening. And that is true. I like to make things easy on myself. Um, and a lot of times that ends up um, matching with my other goals for my garden. So Let's start with a couple more slides on that foundational piece, which is prevention. Uh, you probably had someone in your family that liked to say an ounce of prevention is a pound of cure, and that goes for garden management too. So what you wanna do is prevent pests, insects from, and diseases from getting out of balance in the first place by providing an environment that favors the plants that you're cultivating. So whether you're planting tree fruit or vegetables or perennial wildflowers, choose species or varieties that are suited for your conditions. In the garden, that might mean vegetable varieties that are resistant to or tolerant of certain pathogens. 
So tomatoes are an example of a plant that is really susceptible to a variety of different pathogens like late blight, early blight, septorial leaf spot, you name it. So if you've had that issue in your garden, the best way to manage it going forward is to choose and plant varieties that are resistant. Resistance to different pathogens is usually advertised in whatever seed catalog you go through, uh, but a good source for resistant varieties, at least here on the East Coast, is Cornell University. In your perennial plants, there are sometimes horticultural varieties that are more resistant to certain plant diseases, but planning out a resilient wildflower planting is more about choosing the species, the native species, rather than the variety that would be tolerant of the conditions in your geographic area, your ecoregion, and your yard. So if your yard or, or area is dry or prone to midsummer droughts, you wanna be looking for species that are native to your ecoregion that are drought tolerant and can do well without much water. Prevention is also about building the soil. So making sure you have good drainage, adding in organic matter if you have sandy or heavy clay soils, and then checking the nutrient levels and the pH. Like Amay said, a lot of wildflowers tend to prefer sort of a neutral pH, but there are plants that like it more acidic. Um, you can take that soil sample and send it in for testing at your state lab, which is totally worth it. You can learn a lot from a good soil test. And there's probably a soil testing lab in your state, but here in the Northeast, UMass Amherst is an inexpensive option for your home garden soil tests. And then the final piece here is watering, which is something that we can often get wrong. So you wanna water wisely, not too much, not too little. The best options, at least that I've found for garden watering are soaker hoses or drip lines, drip irrigation, instead of those overhead sprinklers that go back and forth. Those overhead sprinklers tend to just water the top inch or two of the soil and they promote pretty shallow root growth so what you want to promote, especially when you have um, or are anticipating drought, is, is deep root growth so that your plants can then send those roots deeper and withstand heat and drought stress later in the season. And the best way to do that is with a soaker hose or a drip line. You can turn it on, go do something else, and then come back when the water has soaked in deeply. So that's, the, that's sort of the first layer of preventive management. The next step deeper is there's, some, there's other tools that you can add to this preventive toolbox. And one set of those tools are, are physical barriers and mulches. So in a vegetable garden, this might mean something like a floating row cover. That's something that can be used to exclude certain insect pests from susceptible crops. So that's like flea beetles from various greens, cabbage loopers from brassicas, early season cucumber beetles from your melons and squash and cucumbers. They're also good at keeping other garden nibblers like squirrels out of your garden beds. Those row covers can also be repurposed for extending the season for your warm season crops. Organic mulches are a simple addition to gardens for weed control and moisture retention around your plants. Um, one practice I do use for pollinator conservation is to leave some areas that sort of at the back of my beds without mulch so that there's some bare soil around the back of the beds for bees to nest in. They do have a hard time getting in through the two or three inches of mulch that a lot of people use for, for weed control in their beds. One thing I did want to mention in terms of preventive management is that many of you might, may compost your yard waste or other materials which you then put back into your garden beds to improve the soil. But if you are composting, you do want to make sure that your compost is reaching high enough temperatures to actually kill off pathogens from any plant material that you're putting in there. So that usually can't be accomplished without some active management. So you might like passive management for your overall garden, but you can't do a pa passive management of your compost pile, especially if you have more infested plant material. So you do have to turn and recharge that pile with fresh carbon, nitrogen, water, airflow to make it reach higher temperatures. Other preventive steps you can take include pruning trees and shrubs to improve airflow and help them um, stay resistant to more of the, the diseases that they might be susceptible to. 
You can also use trap crops to attract and manage insects that might otherwise become pests on various crops. So for example, planting a row of lovage on either side of your tomatoes to attract tomato hornworms before they get into the tomatoes would be an example of a trap crop. It's not, trap crops aren't a one size fits all approach. Um, every crop tends to attract a specific set of pests and um, every trap crop does the same, but they can, they can fit very easily into different kinds of home garden settings from border plantings and intercrops to container gardens. So they can work well for both small and large garden settings. Okay. But even the best planned gardens sometimes have things go wrong. So what you want to do is continuously monitor the plants and the insects that are visiting those plants. Monitor and document. Um, sometimes you'll see insects directly, like these flea beetles on brassicas. Sometimes you're only going to see plant damage or other symptoms like skeletonized leaves. This is a leaf miner. Um, that's just made its way between the leaf tissue on these leaves. Sometimes you're gonna see things like the, the evidence that insects have already been there, like frass or insect poop, fine webbing, mining trails, those types of things. So what you're gonna to wanna to do is take good notes and take good photos. A smartphone can be very useful in gardening and getting an identification of things. Take good photos. Uh, as close as you can get them to help experts identify the specific issue that you're having and then keep some notes on when it developed, what kinds of symptoms you're seeing, how many insects are present, and the extent of the damage and symptoms that you see. So all of those observations are going to be helpful in both identifying and then figuring out how you're going to manage that issue. So one of the most fulfilling things that I've um, done in the past few months as I've spent a lot of time at home has just been going out in the morning and having a coffee and watching the flowers in my yard and what's visiting them, seeing all the bees and butterflies and other things fly around and visit my plants. But even as I'm sort of cataloging all the bees that I'm seeing, I also see when things are starting to look weird. So this is my echinacea, my purple cone flower that I have right out in my front yard. And typically it looks more like what you see on the left with perfectly rounded heads and lots of bees visiting it for nectar and pollen. But a lot of the heads in my echinacea started to look more like the photo on the right, which was kind of deformed flower heads and crappy looking petals. And then as I started to look really closely, you could see frass and sort of little trails of, um, of insect debris in, in and among all of those heads and things weren't visiting the flowers. So how could I figure out what was going wrong? So what I needed to do was to get a firm identification on what was actually happening with my echinacea. So after I looked closely, I, I could pull the flower heads apart and I actually found the culprit inside the flower head was this little brown and tan striped caterpillar at work. Um, but I needed to know more. What was it? How and when does it reproduce? Does it have specific host plants other than my echinacea? And then what kind of conditions might have led to this infestation getting out of hand in my garden? And what could I do about it? So it's really important to know what you're dealing with before you make any kind of decisions about whether you're gonna take steps to manage it. You have to know its life cycle and its habitat needs. And just because something is eating your plants doesn't actually mean that it's harmful. It might be beneficial in some way. You have to have caterpillars to have butterflies and moths. So knowing the kind of insect or plant disease if you're seeing other symptoms is critical for learning about how you might be able to manage it if you want to, because it, it ends up being about removing sources of food and shelter that are specific to that pest. So, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed in that I have a degree in entomology, so, but not everyone knows an entomologist, even though it does come in handy. Um, there's lots of resources online that can help with identifying insects and plant diseases. So a quick internet search 
with a description of the insect uh, and the damage to the affected plant can be a good start. I can't tell you how many times, even though I'm an entomologist, someone has sent me a kind of a blurry photo and I'll just go to Google and I say, well, black and yellow spider with spiky abdomen or something like that, and then look for what the, what the results are and eventually figure it out. Um, but I would be cautious about over-interpreting based on your initial search results from that. So for better and more personalized information, I would get in touch with your local university cooperative extension office or master gardener hotline or plant diagnostic laboratory, all of which can offer better and more personalized advice tailored to your local area. I would also be cautious about identifications and advice that you receive from pest control or land care companies, which have an incentive to sell products and services that are associated with that advice. There are other online options that could help you figure out what insects are in your yard. So like I said, smartphone can be a great tool um, and bugguide.net is a great online resource for insect identifications. It has this community of experts that provide photo identification of different insects. Um, also, if you have an account with Reddit, there's a, there's a subreddit that's called what, What's This Bug that has an active committee, a community of enthusiastic insect ideas that are ready to help you identify it. Sometimes you can get an identification in two or three minutes when you use that uh, particular subreddit. Sometimes posting to social media platforms can also give you helpful info. But again, take it with a grain of salt, depending on where it's coming from. So in my own case, I was able to identify the caterpillar that was on my echinacea through a simple internet search that matched the description of the damage and the plant it was on with the image of the caterpillars that I'd found. So I had sunflower moth caterpillars feeding on the pollen and the immature seeds of my purple coneflower. So when you see kind of damage symptoms on your plants, the first thing to do is to go back to the foundation that you've already set up and just double check to make sure that the plant has what it needs to thrive. So stressed plants tend to look much worse and have a much more difficult time mustering defenses against infection or against an insect pest. Um, sometimes the things that are actually a nutrient deficiency can masquerade as a fungal problem. So blossom end rot in tomatoes an example, is an example of something that you might think is a fungal disease, but it's actually the result of calcium deficiency. So you do want to double check that what you're seeing isn't the result of lack of water, uh, a nutrient imbalance, an issue with soil pH, or an airflow and spacing problem. The first year I put in my pollinator plants in my front yard, I did it without even really thinking hard about spacing. Um, so I ended up having a lot of powdery mildew issues with, with my, my Monarda and some of my other plants. Um, and then the next year I ended up pulling them out again, transplanting them, moving them out so that they all had enough space. And it has made a world of difference. My plants are much happier since I did that. So when you're thinking about whether you wanna intervene, you have to think about what level of damage you're willing to tolerate. Um, and that comes back to the kind of goals and intentions that you have for your garden and yard. Um, are you trying to conserve insects and create wildlife habitat? Are you dependent on the fruits and vegetables you're growing for food? Reflecting on those kinds of intentions can help you decide whether and how it makes sense to intervene. So for my own yard, my main goals are conserving the diversity of insects and birds and other wildlife that are living around me by planting native, pl native flowering plants, um, to have a beautiful space that I like to go out with my coffee in the mornings and evenings to enjoy, and to manage uh, my property with as little effort as possible. So those are my three garden goals, and they overlap in a lot of ways in, in what I end up doing in there. But by keeping sort of conservation front and center in my goals, it's easier for me to accept some messiness and some chaos and let go of some of the imperfections and nibbled leaves. Because a lot of times that just means that there are things enjoying my plants that I've planted. Um, as long as those flowering resources are still available for the pollinators, which are sort of at the top of the list for me in terms of conservation. 
So based on all of those goals, I made the decision not to use pesticides, including organic pesticides, which as Amay talked about, aren't free from risk. So I wanted to create a system in my yard that's healthy and functional without minimal, without, with minimal intervention and disturbance. And sometimes that means I can't grow everything I wanna grow um, in the way that I garden, um, and that's okay with me. But I do sometimes still intervene with non-chemical methods when something seems really out of balance or the damage is a threat to the survival of the plant. Um, so I also, at the same time was, that I was having some issues with my echinacea, found that I was having some issues with my monarda, which is my bee balm, which is a key resource for a lot of bees that visit my garden. Um, and it also was having sort of deformed flower heads with lots of evidence of insect frass. That one ended up being um, horsemint caterpillars, which were in pretty much all of my Monarda flower heads. Um, and for both the purple cone flower and the bee balm, the presence of caterpillars in my flower heads wasn't in itself a threshold for action. I liked that the caterpillars are using my garden resources because caterpillars are an important food resource for, beer, for birds that are trying to feed their young. Um, and in, in many years, those caterpillar infestations are kept in check um, by other things that are using my garden. But sometimes they, in this case this year, they have pretty much taken out all of my Monarda flower heads. This is actually one of the few flower heads that produced any flowers. Um, and because one of my goals is specifically conserving bees and other pollinators, um, when the caterpillars were feeding on every available flower head of my bee balm and echinacea, it took away pollen and nectar resources for other insects. Um, so I'm lazy. It did take pretty much the removal of all of the flowers from my bee balm or purple cone flower before I decided to act, but that was my threshold for action. Now I had different thresholds for taking action in my spinach, um, which wasn't providing flowering resources. Um, I had spinach leaf miners earlier this year. Um, and when you're deciding, once you know what you're dealing with and you've decided you do want to intervene, cultural management options are really the first line of defense. So for my bee balm and my purple cone flower, what I ended up doing was clipping off flower heads that had signs of caterpillars and bagging them up in the garbage. Um, that was my solution for reducing the outbreaks of both of those types of caterpillars. I didn't treat the plants and I didn't clip off every flower that had a caterpillar in it just the ones that were really showing signs of heavy damage. And after a couple of rounds of that, I had more flowers coming out that started to develop normally without signs of infestations. So those flowers then were available for pollinators to use. For the leaf miner outbreak, it was the same deal, sanitation, um, just hand picking out the leaves that were affected by leaf miners and leaving the ones that were still healthy. Um, and again, that took care of that particular outbreak in my vegetable garden. For other insects, hand picking and squishing, using water to knock insects off plants, those can be first good first steps for dealing with pests in the garden. You know, hand picking can be really tedious. I've spent a lot of late nights picking slugs off of lettuce, but it is deliberate and cautious and saves other wildlife in the garden from harm. So I may already talked a lot about the risks of pesticides. The pesticides that are designed to control unwanted insects rarely distinguish between beneficial insects and those that cause harm. And most home gardens can be managed well without pesticides. So what we're hoping to do is encourage more of you to be passive gardeners, to go pesticide free in your gardens. Because when you have the foundation of prevention in place and you can accept that a lot of different insects might be using your gardens, in ways that you don't, might not always like, and that that's okay, your whole attitude towards gardening can shift. But we also do recognize that that's not where everyone might be at this point. Maybe you have a prized plant that you can't imagine letting go of. It might be your grandmother's rose bush, your mom's raspberry canes, and it's being threatened by an insect outbreak or disease. So if pesticides are part of your management system, we do want you to consider using them only when something is really threatening the health and survival of a plant, not cosmetic damage and injury. Um, 
And we want you to take those preventive and non-chemical steps to try and deal with pests before resorting to pesticides. So if you do use pesticides, please seek out information on the toxicity of the product you're using to both people and pollinators. Um, that's true if you have a lawn care company as well that's taking care of your gardens. Keep in mind that there's a lot of deceptive marketing in the pesticide, pest control, and lawn care worlds on toxicity. And that just because something is organic or that it's, quote, derived from natural sources, um, that it's not toxic because that's not often the case. If you're uh, not sure exactly what your land care company is using, ask them. We do have resources available to help you gauge the toxicity of different pesticides to pollinators, and we can help answer your questions about pesticide risk. So I have a slide with some of those resources at the end, um, but you can find all of them in our publications database at xerces.org. Just search for pesticides. So to come full circle, building a resilient, healthy ecosystem in your yard and garden is all about careful observation. Observe the plants in your yard. How are they doing? What are they attracting? What conditions of moisture, temperature, and soil they respond to? And get observant about the plants in your neighborhood too. What grows well and is buzzing with all kinds of different insects in your neighbor's yard is a better indication of how that plant is gonna do in your yard than how good it looks on the day that you see it at the nursery. So this is a case where it's absolutely encouraged to be a nosy neighbor. I've made several friends around my neighborhood by just asking people about their plants. So I would encourage you to do the same. And over the long term, it's a continuous improvement process. Um, watching your plants, going out with your coffee, evaluating what's working, and then making decisions about how you're gonna improve things over time. Maybe you can't make every change um, every year, but you don't have to, you can do little things at a time. My front yard started with just a few pollinator plants and a lot of grass, and now there's a lot more space dedicated to flowering plants than there is to grass. And I've had a lot of time this summer to think about soil fertility and airflow and plants, and so next year it's gonna be even better. So I know this presentation um, is running a little bit long. We will have time for a lot of your questions. And we've talked about a lot of different topics, including a little bit of doom and gloom. But I did wanna end with a quick meditation on our team's philosophy of change. So our vision is a future where all landscapes, whether it's towns and cities, farms or natural areas, can enjoy thriving, diverse and abundant invertebrate populations. That takes solutions at all scales, including voluntary changes at homes and on farms, as well as regulatory solutions that can lead to broader actions on the ground. So we've talked a little bit about the home side of things today. All of this work is guided by science and also the precautionary principle, taking preventive action in the face of uncertainty, shifting the burden of proof to the proponents of an activity. So in this case, pesticide manufacturers, and exploring a wide range of alternatives to potentially harmful actions. Pesticides is a really challenging arena to work in sometimes. There's lots of strong feelings about them. And what we're trying to do is to do our best to meet people where they are and encourage them to move outside of their comfort zone to achieve conservation goals. Managing gardens and yards without pesticides can feel like a big ask, but the long-term payoff for ecological and human health can be great. So we're gonna keep asking. A lot of our work is through outreach like this webinar and building these kinds of relationships with people who come to our webinars and partners on the ground, working together to find solutions is often the deepest, longest term change. So we'll, we hope you take all of this to heart as you work in your own communities to conserve and protect pollinators. And we hope you reach out when you have questions. So if you're interested in digging in more, we have a plethora of resources online at xerces.org on organic pesticides, fungicide impacts, neonicotinoids, um, and a whole suite of publications about pollinator protection at home and in cities and campuses. So if you go on our website and you've looked through our publications and you feel like you're still not finding what you're looking for, please reach out and we, we're happy to help. So with that, I will end and turn it over to take questions. Thank you so much, um, Emily May, as well as Amay, for 
that great presentation. So we are a little bit over time. Um, if you do have to leave, just know that this recording will be on our YouTube channel. So if you want to hear the question and answer section, you're able to view that later. But we are going to go for about 10 to 15 minutes to answer some of these questions. I also put in the chat the resources that Ame had mentioned during her presentation and some of the links did not come through. So I'm just sending it one more time. Those are both of the webinars as well as several fact sheets that she mentioned as well as a link to the webinar that is coming up in a few weeks that's going to talk about beneficial insects and how they can help with pest control in your garden. So the first question we have here is a difficult one that we get asked a lot, but they're asking to please advise on how to get rid of wasps or hornets. Not sure what kind, but they seem to be in the roof of their porch. Very aggressive. Thank you. Emily and I are looking at each other across the, the expanse of the country. <laughs> um, a lot, there are a lot of questions that popped up today that are uh, how to deal with specific pests in specific areas. And I have to admit, I feel ill-equipped without knowing the specific place, without knowing the type of wasps that we're looking at, how best to respond. Uh, I would hate for you to have, you know, a white-faced hornet and me suggesting that you were should, you know, go out at night in in sturdy clothes and knock it down. So, um, uh, I'm not sure, Emily. Do you have specific examples of what you want? I feel like every to me, it's very situational and it's hard for to answer uh, broadly. Yeah, it is. It is a hard one to answer broadly. Um, a lot of times, you know, those types of wasps and hornets, you're able to, um, where they are not right in the path of where people are, are moving, where they're not interacting with people, you can leave them be. But it sounds like in this case, it, it is causing problems with human interaction. Um, so I don't have great, you know, without looking at it, without seeing a photo, it's hard for me to suggest um, a specific approach. Um, but I would you know, reach out to us if you have specific questions and, um, you know, you can always look in and talk to your local master gardeners and extension uh, for their suggestions. You know, and, and on that kind of taking the exact route that Emily May outlined today uh, and, and reaching out and when you reach out to your master gardeners, I know here in Oregon, they highly recommend that you let them know do you want it to be an organic product? Are you looking for cultural, mechanical, physical alternatives and to not use a pesticide? And you can express that to them. And hopefully where you are, those are things that they'll be able to take into consideration when they help you figure out how to respond to what sounds like a wasp in a place where you don't want it to be. All right, thank you. The next question is specific to ladybugs. Someone has mites on their bamboo and their arborist suggested that they buy ladybugs. Is there a better option for predatory insects? And should they be buying ladybugs? I know both Emily and Sharon are looking a lot into conservation biological control to support the species that are um, valuable compared to bringing in and augmenting uh, and some of the concerns with augmenting. So I'm going to let one of the two of them respond to this. Karen's still on mute though. But. So the, the one thing I will say um, about the augmentative, augmentative biocontrol, which is the practice of purchasing a mass reared um, predatory insect and then releasing it. Um, well, one, there are some concerns about um, how those mass reared insects might affect native predatory insects or native beneficials um, that are local to your area. But the other thing about releasing lady beetles as adults is that a lot of times they're not effective because they just immediately leave the area. So you bring in lady beetles and you release them and then they immediately leave your backyard. Um, so they're not actually feeding on the intended pest. Um, so the best thing you can do is to try and build up populations of, of local lady beetles. Um, there are some um, predatory mites that are also available, but again, I've I wouldn't want to recommend them without knowing more about your specific um, pest and situation. And I've read time and time, I'm on a number of listservs for different entomologists and landscape managers, and 
sometimes waiting out those aphids, it was aphids, I think, on the bamboo, sometimes waiting them out draws in the natural enemies over time. And it's, a, it's never comfortable to wait it out if you're worried, but it's amazing how you get that population of aphids high enough and all of a sudden there's a lot of hungry insects coming to feed. I saw that there had been a question about um, BT dunks in, in mosquitoes and whether those would affect butterflies. And I did want to address that one because it's a common question that we get. So the strain of BT that is used in mosquito dunks is specific to mosquitoes and fleas, I believe, um, or mosquito, mosquitoes and gnats. Um, that's right. Um, so there's a different strain of BT that is used for control of caterpillars that's um, not the same as the mosquito dunks. So the mosquito dunk will not have an impact on your butterflies and moths. Yeah, and um, you can look at it, you'll see BTI, and the I is for the strain, Israelensis, Israelensis. Israelensis, yeah. Yes, and then uh, it's BTK for lepidopteran species that would be targeted to lepidopteran species like moths and butterflies. So they are different. As she mentioned, the strains, you look for that last letter on the BT product. And I have also had questions in the past about whether you can use mosquito dunk water on um, for watering your garden. Um, and so that is, I would not use it on anything that you're growing for food. You're not supposed to use mosquito dunk water on crops of any kind. You, um, you could use it on um, flower beds if you wanted to. And, you know, when we're thinking mosquito management, um, definitely better to try to, when you can, if you can drain or dump water and just to to knock out those larvae instead of using a dunk. If you've got a pond where you, you know, or something that you're not gonna be draining it every few days, that's not reasonable, that's when you would consider using a dunk to manage that, the larva. Um, but we always urge people to first try to prevent them from being able to, um, to reproduce by draining water. Anyway, I know in, in um, Boulder, Colorado, they're working really hard to even reduce their use of BT because there are some concerns being raised about it in, in ecological systems. There was a question, Emily May, that you had typed the answer to, but I think a lot of people have asked this question in the past and it might be helpful for other folks about leaving plant stalks and stems in their yard through the winter to provide habitat for those beneficial insects, but they're not sure when to remove them and clean them from their yard or over overwintering pollinators, excuse me. Is there a temperature, maybe that would indicate when for them to take them down? Yeah, that is a great question. And um, the rule of thumb, thumb that I use is um, leave them over winter and then you can start cleaning them out um, or come back when air temperatures are regularly reaching 55 to 60 degrees, which is when insects are starting to, to come out and be active. Um, and what I do end up doing is cutting them back and then bundling them up or leaving them in a brush pile at the back of my yard. Um, so whatever is left in those stems, if it hasn't already emerged, it can emerge later in that season. And then those plant materials will break down over time um, and they won't reuse the same, those same stems that have been taken out. Okay, perfect. Next question, our arborist has recommended borer treatment for our, mature, for our mature oaks. We are concerned, what questions would you be asking? I may, do you wanna take that one? It's a great question about what questions to ask. Um, I was just responding to Christine. This is the, um, there's a stem borer for a tree with the pest. I quickly, could you please repeat it again? I was. Yeah, there's a, there's a borer and um, we're getting recommendations. What questions should I be asking about what they're wanting to use and et cetera? Okay. Um, so, you know, I guess you, wanting to make sure you first look at what the pest is and if it's at a level and is that tree going to be at harm of, is it, is it a nuisance pest or is it a pest that's actually gonna impact the health of that tree? Um, then, and, and finding out more about that. Then looking at what chemical is going to be used. And when you ask what product, it's helpful to, um, to ask the EPA registration number and you know, the name of the product. And then 
you could actually come to us and we would be happy to look into that pesticide a little deeper to understand what risks there might be. Is it something that's gonna be long lived? Are there pollinator concerns? Are there other options? But knowing, just like Emily said, knowing what the pest is, knowing the level of impact it might have on that plant, and then knowing how best to address it is gonna help figure out. But just because a tree is struggling, you know, an injection treatment isn't necessarily going to, to solve the problem or be, uh, to, be, to be safe. Even though it seems like, oh, it's going in the tree, it's not a problem. You know, the science is showing actually that's not the case. Is that helpful? Emily May, what would you add? I think that's the main thing. I mean, I, I would definitely want to know um, when that pest might become a problem for the survival of the trees and um, specifically what they are recommending to be using, what's the active ingredient, what's the product, so that I could go look up toxicity information and have an understanding of how it actually works on the, on the pest and what else it might affect. We have a lot of questions filtering in. I saw there was a question about, and this one also might be for May, about the takeaway from termite treatments. And is the takeaway just, if you do have to treat for termites, not to have flowering plants around the base of your house? Yeah, I want to answer that. And I was also just reading one on our stance on IPM on invasives to flag that as another. Um, it's a hard takeaway. So, uh, to, and, and I think this is the kind of place where we each have to sit with what it feels right to us. The thing that's good about termites, carpenter ants, these are slow moving pests. You don't have to act quickly. So when you identify a termite issue at your house or a carpenter ant, you don't have to immediately go out and, and, and respond with a chemical to knock that, that pest down because we are worried. Our houses are very important to us. We don't, we do want to protect them. Um, so take the time to look into what it is, find out what company you might want to work with. You, you know, you might end up using a chemical, some sort of a bait that's going to draw them in instead of a, a broad, you know, a broad trench, which is, you know, a barrier treatment. There's different types of options. You also want to make sure back to that piece, you, you want to ask the questions to make sure that you're getting rid of the, 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 the reasons that, that, that those termites are there or those carpenter ants or other structural pests are there. So do you have really weak wood that's, that's, that's rotting, that might be drawing them in? Uh, is, it, is it the water that's in your area? You know, wh what are the, the causes that it's gonna allow them to come back? Because you don't want to knock down a pest and knock down those termites only to end up having them come right back to your yard. So those are some of the things then, and definitely as far as for planting, it does seem that you wouldn't want to be putting in uh, anything that's going to be pollinator attractive in those areas where there had been a, a trench or other type of treatment. Hopefully you wouldn't use a treatment that would allow that level of contamination in your yard because there are a lot more targeted ways of managing the pests. But if you already had such a treatment, I, I would avoid putting in, in anything that would be pollinator attractive in that area. Emily or Sharon, anything you want to add? I think that's I think that's the main thing and if you if you do have flowering plants around your home and you go for a drench or some, some other termite treatment you're probably going to want to move those flowering plants before the drench goes in and move them somewhere else in your yard all right thank you so we are coming up on time but I think we have time for one more question Ame did you want to answer the question about IPM Oh, I, I want to, and I want Emily and Sharon to weigh in too. Um, it's a really tough question. So the question was specific about noxious and invasive uh, weeds and, and IPM. And Xerces absolutely uh, grounds all of our pest management decisions within that IPM framework. So we're, and, and there's many ways that people define IPM, which is integrated pest management. We really look at it from starting at that base of prevention and avoiding pests and using sanitation. And you know, with invasives, it's really keeping them out. So an, an education to inform people to minimize the spread of the different invasives. Um, when you get to the place where herbicides might be part of the option, uh, we definitely in some of our restoration and other practices, we do use herbicides to, you know, to knock down invasive and noxious species 
for the short term. We try not to have it be a long-term solution. It is part of that initial phase of prepping an area, and we have to think long-term about how do we avoid those, chem those, those, in those species from coming back in and reinvading so that we don't have to use herbicides again. So within that whole framework of making sure that we are doing everything we can to minimize the use of herbicides, there are times when herbicides are part of the solution. Um, Emily May and I talk a lot about if you put all the time and energy to creating pollinator habitat, yet you've left a ton of weed species in that area where you're planting, you're going to lose that habitat really quickly. So sometimes herbicides are part of that initial step to, to manage. Sometimes you can get away with some other cropping and, and solarization and other options where you don't end up needing chemical options, but sometimes they are part of that, of that role. Yeah. That's true too, not just for prepping a meadow, but for dealing with, you know, noxious and invasive species that can't be removed by hand or are very challenging to remove mechanically. Um, we do, we, we are always trying to learn new methods for alternative weed management for some of these invasives. There's a ton of Japanese knotweed where I live in Connecticut, which is a really challenging species to manage organically or without pesticide inputs, chemical uh, herbicides. Um, but we're trying new techniques um, all the time for trying to learn how to do that effectively um, through other methods. But there, are, there is a time and a place where herbicides are helpful for keeping invasives down and letting natives come back uh, into those plant communities. I see so many other great questions and I don't know that we're able to get to them. <laughs> I'm so sorry for that, I, but we do have, we do have the, our contact information there um, and we are happy to try and help answer your questions. We have resources on our website that can answer a lot of these when you start reading through them. Amay, do you have anything you'd like to end on? No, I'm just really thrilled that you all came out and joined us for this. I hope that it was, was helpful. And, I know I love listening to Emily May go through that whole process because honestly, when you come to us and ask us a question, that's the process that we go through to try to help you. So, um, you know, and, and it is a little intimidating. I'm not an entomologist, uh, but I'm learning and slowly getting better at this, this same process. So you don't have to be, you know, the Harriet the Spy loving garden, avid gardener entomologist that Emily May is to be able to work through this. So definitely feel free to reach out to us. We definitely can give you um, greater depth on some of the, if there's chemical options that people are considering. Try to go through this process first as well to think about the, because I'm seeing so many different questions about specific pests in your, in your home gardens and yards. Thank you, May. Thank you, Emily May. Thank you, Sharon. And thank you, Stephanie, for being our captioner today. So our next webinar will be coming up on August 20th, the same time and you can register for that. There is a link in the chat and it's also on our website, but that will be just sort of a continuation of this presentation, but looking at your insect allies, the beneficial insects in your garden. So definitely check that out. If you want to watch this presentation again, it'll be up on YouTube by next week at the latest. And um, like our pesticide team has graciously offered, please contact them if you have questions. This is a tough topic and we got a lot of great ones. So thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to the presenters for your time today and for your expertise, and I hope that you all have a wonderful rest of your day.